Hi there, everyone, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, a podcast about gardening, botanical history, and literature. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and today is September 27th. Today in botanical history, we'll celebrate a Spanish botanist, a Swiss poet and diarist, and an American industrialist. We'll hear an excerpt from a best-selling book where the main character is a 12-year-old girl named September. And we grow that garden library today with a book that offers a year's worth of fantastic wildflower paintings and notes. And then we'll wrap things up with a lab girl, a scientist whose incredible book was released just five years ago. Can't believe it. Well, I tell you what, we are ending the year strong around here. Up at the cabin, we are installing gravel pathways and patios. We're putting in a new fire pit. We added a cupola to the shed. That was a find on Facebook Marketplace. We are, let's see, we're painting the weather vane, which is a landing duck that's going to be painted copper. So that's gonna look great. And we're doing all this activity up there in preparation for my son's graduation. PJ will be graduating from high school in the spring. And so his graduation party will be up at the cabin. So we're doing all this activity. And I think I have about 50 perennials that I have split all summer long and then kept alive in pots. And those babies have got to get in the ground. So that's what I've been working on is putting all that together. I think PJ and I were out in the garden, I want to say something like eight or nine hours yesterday, moving big rocks, really big boulders. Whew, that is exhausting work. But, you know, we got it down to a science. We started using some pretty simple tools that really helped us when we were placing these big, big boulders. So one of the things we used, of course, is a mallet. They're great for tapping things into place, but they're also really great for pummeling the sand below the boulder, which a lot of times after we've dug, that needs just a little bit of shaping. And so I'd kind of dig the hole and then PJ would come along with the mallet and then pound it into the shape that we needed for the boulder so that it would sit nicely and not tip. Now, since a lot of these big boulders were being used on the perimeters of beds or to edge stairs, it was really important to make sure that they weren't tippy. And every time I'm placing them, I'm imagining a little kid that wants to come along and step on them. And so I want to make extra sure that they don't roll around and that they don't tip so that somebody doesn't get hurt down the road. The other thing that I keep in the back of my mind is to watch out for edges. You know, every now and then you get a piece that really looks great, but at the same time, the really good looking pieces seem to have some sharp or rough edges. So I had to keep that in mind as well as I was placing them on the path, just to make sure that my future self didn't stub my toe on that or worse I fall and then that's the part of the rock that I hit I could just see that happening so anyway that's what we were doing this weekend you can probably hear it in my voice that I'm a little bit tired because I'm recording this late at night we didn't get back to the house until late and then it's just been a flurry of activity once we get back from the cabin it's always a little bit crazy especially on a Sunday night now that the kids are back in school but it's all good it's all good well hey before I forget I want to make sure that I share a couple of recipes with you they're perfect for fall it's that time of year the first one is is Ina Garten's Roasted Tomato Basil Soup. This is my favorite tomato soup recipe. It's the recipe I use with all of the tomatoes that I harvest from my garden. It's that time of year when I'm roasting tomatoes like a crazy lady just so I can make this soup because it's my absolute favorite. And I make it in batches and then I freeze it and it's a great soup to have on hand. You can pull it out all season long, all winter long through the spring and I never get sick of it either. So that's another great thing. So I will share that with you. It's Ina Garten's Roasted Tomato Basil Soup. It's fantastic. The other recipe that I really love is P. Allen Smith's Apple Crumble. 
fantastic. It's got all of the usual suspects, rolled oats, brown sugar, cinnamon, allspice, Yum, and it looks so pretty. It's unbelievable. There's a little video that he includes with this recipe, and I'm getting to like that more and more as I have my little Google Home, the little video Google device in my kitchen where I can actually watch recipes while I'm in there. And so I like that he included this little video of it. Of course, the wonderful thing about it is the crumble topping. So yay for that. But this one I've already made twice this fall. Can't get enough of it. Can't keep it around with the boys, of course, coming home hungry from high school. I've been getting one bag of Honeycrisp apples every single week from the grocery store. So it's definitely apple season around here. Now I have to mention really quickly too that my other favorite apple recipe is my mom's recipe that she got from a columnist in our hometown newspaper in Worthington, Minnesota. It was from Dorothy Rickers, if you happen to be in that area or know of Dorothy. She always had such great recipes. And this is a recipe for apple bars. And what makes these apple bars so fantastic is the really easy to make crust on the bottom. And then basically it's P. Allen Smith on top. But that's kind of how it is with these apple recipes. It reminds me a little bit of rhubarb recipes because they're all kind of a variation of the same basic ingredients if you love rhubarb. And it's kind of the same thing with apple in the fall. So there you go. But I will post these in the Facebook group for the show. So if you're listening to all of this and you're starting to get hungry, join the club, but don't worry about tracking it down. I'll stick it all in the Facebook group. You'll be able to catch it all there. So I will include a link to Ina Garten's tomato basil soup. Fantastic. I will include the P. Allen Smith recipe and I'll throw in my mom's apple bar recipe courtesy of Dorothy Rickers. So there you go. All right, it's time for today's curated news. <laughs> Okay, well, today's curated news is a little bit of a left turn from the world of gardening, and yet it's not. This is a fun curated article, and it's all about new books that are related to design. This was featured in wallpaper.com, and the title of the article is New Books, How Designers See the World. So this is a roundup of books about designers. Now, for me, the way my mind works is I can hear something about office design or building design, and that will translate for me when I'm out in the garden. And so if you fall into that same camp, one or some of these books may speak to you in the same way. In any case, this was a fascinating list to go through. There's a really great book about inclusive design. That was great. And then there's also this really crazy fun book. It's called Buchanan Smith's Axe Handbook. This would be a great book for dad or grandpa. And this is a book about tools. So it's the history, evolution, craft, care, and use of everyday tools. Really fun. And it's got the font and then the drawings and such. And it just screams dad to me. So this looks like a book that my dad will be getting. I hope that he's not listening to this but that's on my list now for Christmas. So there you go. I just quickly added it on Amazon. Let's see, is there anything else on here? Ooh, here's a really good one. A Thousand Design Patents. Now, I haven't seen this book yet, but I bet you anything that there are a few garden-related patents in this book. If you get it and you happen to see some of those, let me know about it. That's always fun. Let's see, uh, it wraps up here with, there's the alphabet of architectural models, that looks very good, and the age of combustion. This is one my son would like. So fascinating books on design, and I called this little segment Designer Vision, seeing the world the way designers do. They definitely bring a unique perspective, and it's one we tap into again and again in our gardens. 
All right, if you would like to check out this post, it was featured on wallpaper.com. Don't worry about it. I'll throw this one in the Facebook group as well. You can find it there. Just search for the word designer and this post will pop up. Now, if you're not in the Facebook group, don't worry about it. You can always join the Facebook group. It's completely free. You can join at any time. You can leave the group at any time. And all of the articles that I curate for you are put in the Facebook group. You just have to search them up. If you'd like to join the Facebook group, all you have to do is head on up to the top of the search bar in the place where you'd normally type in someone's name. You just type in Daily Gardener Community. That's the name of our group. You'll see it pop up and then just request to join. And then I will admit you into the group. I think you just have to answer three questions. Very, very easy. And then in you'll go and I'll see you in there. All right, it's time for today's botanical history. Here's botanical history for today, September 27th. Today, we celebrate the heavenly birthday of Simon de Rojas Clemente, who was born on this day, September 27th in 1777. Simon was a Spanish botanist, intellectual, politician, and spy. And he's regarded as the father of European ampelography, which is the identification and classification of grapevines. What a great job title. Well, today, there is a statue of Simon that overlooks the Royal Botanic Garden in Madrid. And I've seen pictures of this on social media, especially when various flowers are in bloom around the statue, and it really looks beautiful. So if you happen to be making a trip to the Royal Botanic Garden there, see if you can find the statue of Simon. Now, way back in the early 1800s, Simon was teaching Arabic, and one of his students was named Domingo Badia Leblik, and he invited Simon on an extensive trip through Africa, from the Atlas Mountains all the way to the Nile River. Now, Domingo was anticipating that they might meet with some resistance from locals that had happened to other explorers who'd attempted various expeditions through the area. And so Domingo and Simon disguised themselves as Muslims, and they even changed their names. And Simon became Mohammed ben Ali. And at some point after joining the expedition, Simon learned that there was an underlying reason for the trip. It was actually the main reason for the trip, and it was to spy on North Africa for Manuel Godoy, who was the first Secretary of State for Spain. Now, following this trip, Simon would go on to explore Andalusia before ultimately returning to Madrid, where he served as the director of the Royal Botanic Garden Library. And this is also when his ampelography work kicked in. In 1820, Simon planted a collection of grapevines at the Madrid Royal Botanic Garden, and to this day, Simon's grapes are among the wine and table grapes that are grown in the garden, and they represent all of the grapes that have been grown in that country since the 18th century. But wait, there's more, because Simon's herbarium contained 186 specimens of grapevines, and his herbarium remains in excellent condition. Now, Simon's herbarium is truly a national treasure. It's one of the oldest collections of grapevines in the world. But what makes it even more special is that he gathered up all of these specimens before phylloxera arrived in Spain because phylloxera wiped out many of the European grapevines. And so to have these samples before they were tainted with phylloxera makes them extra special. And as you might have already guessed, 
Samples of Simon's grapevine specimens have been genetically analyzed thanks to modern DNA testing. And today is the birthday of Henri Frederic Emile. He was a Swiss philosopher and poet, and he was born on this day in 1821. Now, Henri is remembered for his diary, which was called Journal in Time. He kept it from 1847 until 22 days before he died in 1881. And today I thought I would share a few of his entries because they'll really give you a feel for Henri and the way he thought about things and truly just how beautiful his writing was. He truly was a poet. On August 26th, 1868, he wrote, Say to yourself that you are entering upon the autumn of your life, that the graces of spring and the splendors of summer are irrevocably gone, but that autumn too has its beauties. The autumn weather is often darkened by rain, cloud, and mist, but the air is still soft and the sun still delights the eyes and touches the yellowing leaves caressingly. It is the time for fruit, for harvest, for the vintage, the moment for making provision for the winter. My life has reached its month of September. May I recognize it in time and suit thought and action to the fact. And Henri also wrote this popular garden quote in one of his entries. See if you can recognize it. It goes like this. A modest garden contains, for those who know how to look and to wait, more instruction than a library. Great quote. And today is the birthday of James Drummond Dole, the American industrialist. He was born on this day, September 27th in 1877. Known as the Pineapple King, he founded the pineapple industry in Hawaii. His Hawaiian Pineapple Company, or HAPCO as it was known, later became the Dole Food Company. In 1899, James made his way to Hawaii after graduating from Harvard. After realizing that the native Kona pineapple could not be grown commercially, he started growing a Florida variety, a non-native, known as Smooth Cayenne, on 60 acres. The local newspapers scoffed at his idea, but James persisted and he hired help to create a machine that could process a hundred pineapples every minute. He also, incidentally, aggressively marketed the pineapple in mainland America. Within 20 years, his gamble paid off and Hawaiian pineapples dominated the market. And in the first half of the 20th century, the popularity of the pineapple upside-down cake further helped the pineapple become mainstream. Now, in terms of their makeup, pineapples contain an enzymatic protein called bromelain. It's a chemical that prevents gelatin from setting, among many other things. It's also an anti-inflammatory. But once a pineapple is heated for canning, the bromelain is destroyed. And that's how canned pineapple can be used successfully with Jell-O. Little known fact. Now, would you care to guess just how much of the world's pineapple is grown in Hawaii? Well, the answer would be a surprising 0.13. That's right, just 0.13 of the world's pineapple is grown in Hawaii. Aloha. It's time for today's Unearthed Words. (music) 
Today's Unearthed Words come to us from a book that Time Magazine calls one of the most extraordinary works of fantasy for adults or children published so far in this century. This is a book by Catherine Valenta, Cat Valenta, and the title of the book is The Girl Who Circumnavigated Fairyland in a Ship of Her Own Making. Now, in this excerpt, we will hear about September. She's the main character. She's a 12-year-old who lives in Omaha, and she used to have an ordinary life until her father went to war and her mother went to work. Here's the excerpt. She liked anything orange. Leaves, some moons, marigolds, chrysanthemums, cheese, pumpkin, both in pie and out, orange juice, marmalade. Orange is bright and demanding. You can't ignore orange things. She once saw an orange parrot in the pet store and had never wanted anything so much in her life. She would have named it Halloween and fed it butterscotch. Her mother said butterscotch would make a bird sick, and besides, the dog would certainly eat it up. September never spoke to the dog again, on principle. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, Wildflowers of Britain by Margaret Erskine Wilson. This book came out in 2016 and the subtitle is Month by Month. Here's what the publisher wrote about this book. Margaret Erskine Wilson, late president of Kendall Natural History Society, was a keen amateur botanist and watercolorist In 1999, she donated to the Society 150 sheets of watercolor paintings representing a thousand British and Irish plants in flower and fruit painted over many years and in various places. And at the time she donated the paintings, she wrote, begun in 1943-44 for a friend who said, I might learn the names of flowers if you drew them for me in the months they're in flower. Well, the result is this beautiful, previously unpublished book of all of her accurate and informative illustrations painted over 45 years. Over a thousand British and Irish flowers are represented in this book, and still today, it serves Margaret's original purpose. It's an easy way to learn the names of the country's delicate and beautiful wild flowers. This book is 176 pages of a year's worth of Margaret's extraordinary paintings, plus notes, plus the English common names and the scientific names. You can get a copy of Wildflowers of Britain by Margaret Erskine Wilson and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $12. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. Today is the birthday of Hope Jaron, who was born on this day, September 27th in 1969. Hope is an American geochemist and geobiologist, and in her work at the University of Oslo in Norway, she analyzes fossil forests dating way back to the Eocene. And it's hard to believe, but it's been five years since her popular book, Lab Girl, debuted. It was part memoir and part ode to nature. And I thought I would share one of my favorite quotes from Lab Girl with you today to end the show. Here we go. 
There are botany textbooks that contain pages and pages of growth curves, but it's always the lazy S-shaped ones that confuse my students the most. Why would a plant decrease in mass just when it's nearing its plateau of maximum productivity? I remind them that this shrinking has proved to be a signal of reproduction. As the green plants reach maturity, some of their nutrients are pulled back and repurposed toward flowers and seeds. Production of the new generation comes at a significant cost to the parent, and you can see it in a cornfield, even from a great distance. Yes, you can. Happy birthday, Hope Jaren, and thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. The Daily Gardener is produced in lovely Maple Grove in Wyoming, Minnesota. If you want to read today's show notes, just head on over to thedailygardener.org. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for my free Friday newsletter. And don't forget that you have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for listeners of the show. Just search for Daily Gardener Community the next time you're on Facebook and request to join. Last but not least, you can always get in touch by emailing me at jennifer at thedailygardener.org. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and as always, have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow. 